Good morning, church. Well, it feels weird to say that to an empty auditorium. It is just as appropriate today as any other Sunday. We are the church. Whether you are one of the 20 or so in attendance here today, basically the worship team and our volunteers, or you're tuning in online, whether you are joining us live or watching later on in the week, uh, whether you call Grant home or you're joining us because your home church is not meeting right now, we are the church, and it is good to meet together. As we read in Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So while we may not all be in the same room, as long as we can make this happen, we will continue to meet together as a body for encouragement, for nourishment from the word as we are sent out as Christ's representatives in our homes, neighborhoods, and our city. Now, I do want to take this uh, moment to say that it's really good to see everyone. I, I have a couple of screens here where I can see you all in your living rooms uh, through your webcams. No, I, I can't. That's, uh, that was a joke. Um, but uh, don't think that I don't know that you're all in your sweatpants, pajamas, and your hair is not done. Uh, just, I just want you to know that I know uh, how, the, how this is this morning. Uh, but to begin this morning... I wanna start off with a question. What are you thinking about right now? And that doesn't just mean in this moment. What is it that, you, that has been on your mind over the past few days? Now, it's quite possible that most of our answers are the same. If social media and regular media are any indication, whether you've wanted to or not, you've likely had COVID-19 or the coronavirus on your mind. But I want us to flesh this out a little further. What about COVID-19 have you been thinking about? Or perhaps better stated, what did thinking about coronavirus lead you to think about? What thoughts followed what you have heard, read, or seen? Was it fear about contracting the virus yourself? Is, is that where your mind went? Was it an urge to rush to the grocery store and stock up on supplies? Was it disappointment that the sports world is on hold? Or anxiety about what you will do with your kids at home for three weeks? What have you been thinking about about the situation we find ourselves in? Now, the reason I bring this up is to ask, who is the main character in those thoughts? Whose interests are your default consideration in a moment like this? Is it yourself? How you will be inconvenienced or how you can keep safe? Is it others? Are your default thoughts with those who have contracted the virus around the world? Or are they with your friends and neighbors who may need you to come alongside of them? Is it Christ? Are your default thoughts about aligning yourself with God's desires and purposes? Are you seeking him to use these moments to mold you into the likeness of Jesus? Now, please know that I'm not judging anyone here. I, I can't single you out even if I wanted to. I have no clue if your face gave it away. But these are real things that we are called to consider in light of what we have been learning in the New Testament letter of Philippians that we've been walking through over the past few months. You see, Paul, the author of Philippians, is not nearly as interested in our circumstances as he is in our character, our attitudes, our outlook, and our actions in the midst of our circumstances. Or put another way, Paul, it seems, is less concerned with what we see around us than he is with who we're focusing on above us. Which is why the themes that we've found in the text we've been studying so far are joy in the midst of suffering, 
unity in the midst of opposition, peace in the midst of anxieties, and shining like stars in the midst of darkness. None of these themes are dependent on circumstances. Rather, they're dependent on the one who walks with us in any circumstance we may find ourselves in, including a scary, unknown virus that has hit pause on much of what we're familiar and comfortable with. So I invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter two, verse 19, as we continue to listen in on Paul's word to the church. Now the words will be on the screen in front of you, but if you have your copy of the scripture, we're reading from Philippians two, verse 19. Here's what it says. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray today that as we read it, as we dig into it, that the words would jump off the page into our hearts and into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So this text reads a whole lot differently than what we've read so far, doesn't it? The text here seems to take a sharp turn from theological explanation and pastoral exhortation, like we've been reading, to pastoral, to, to personal and practical matters. In fact, what we seem to have here, upon first glance, is a travel itinerary of sorts for two men named Timothy and Epaphroditus. Timothy will be coming soon, verse 19 and 23, and Epaphroditus will be there right away, verse 25 to 29, with even Paul piping in about hoping to come to Philippi soon as well in verse 24. So why is it that we have these plans right in the middle of this book? Right? These types of details are typically included at the end of a letter, if at all, in the final greeting and closing. But here, Paul inserts these details right into the middle of his challenges. Now, what is the reason that Paul does this, inserting a travel itinerary into the middle of an exhortation to the church to live like Christ, to be holy, sanctified, Christ-focused servants? You see, while Paul is sharing some details about their comings and goings, he's actually using these two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, as examples of what this type of life looks like. Paul is saying, if you need an example of what it looks like to live within the will and purposes of God, participating in your own sanctification and pursuit of Christ, look no further than these two brothers. Everything that I've encouraged you with so far in this letter can be seen in the example of these two men. This isn't simply a travel itinerary. Paul is saying that this life of servanthood, of following Jesus, is possible, and you need look no further than our mutual friends, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Paul is giving the Philippian church an object lesson to put skin on what he's been talking about so far. And he uses each of these men to urge the church to look past the end of their own noses 
to fix their eyes on Jesus, even in trial, even in uncertainty, even in prison, as Paul knows all too well. And I believe that for us today, church, we too can learn from the examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus about how we can live out our faith in this unique circumstance we find ourselves in. And to do that, we're going to look at at one statement about each of Timothy and Epaphroditus that is appropriate for where we find ourselves and can speak into our calling today to live a life worthy of the calling of Christ. So let's start with Timothy. Now before we dig in, we actually know quite a bit about this Timothy. Timothy was a close disciple and companion of Paul. He was likely converted uh, during or just after Paul's first missionary journey, which included Timothy's hometown of Lystra. Now, by the time Paul returned to Lystra a couple years later, Timothy was already a respected member of the church. Timothy was the son of a Greek father and a Jewish mother who was herself, uh, along with Timothy's grandmother Eunice, known for their pious dedication to God and their faithfulness in the church. Now, as a young man, uh, Timothy joined Paul as an evangelist and is present with Paul or in partnership with him for the rest of Paul's life, helping provide leadership to the various churches around the Roman Empire until he likely landed in Ephesus, serving as the leader of the church there until his death. In the scriptures, Timothy is the named recipient of two of Paul's letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Timothy is credited as being the co-author of the books 2nd Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and Philemon. So here is a man that Paul handpicked to be his gospel partner, personally discipled him along the way, and trusted him more than any other companion which leads us to the statement I want us to focus on him about this morning. Verse 20 and 21 says this, I have no one else like Timothy who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So the implication here is that Timothy is the exception to this rule. Now, let's not forget that Timothy is not perfect, but he's Paul's best example of someone who follows Paul's charge from chapter two, verse four, that we all ought to look to our own interests, not to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Which brings us back to the question we started off with this morning. Who is the main character of our stories right now? Who is at the forefront of your mind as you navigate the waters of COVID-19? It seems to me that Paul is saying the, the one following the humble example of Christ is the one who shows genuine concern for others, the one who looks past the end of their own nose and sees others the way Christ sees them. Notice that Paul doesn't say that Timothy uh, you know, will simply be concerned or think kindly towards them, but that Timothy will show concern. So the question we need to ask ourselves is if we will be people at this moment in our history who show concern for others. Church, we have an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to serve to care for, to bless, to live out what we say we believe. Now, the goal of this morning is not to mandate a program, but to get each of us thinking about what it would look like to show genuine concern for those we don't see when we look in the mirror. What does it look like for you or for your family to be the hands and feet of Jesus in your neighborhood? Is it picking up groceries for neighbors? Is it only buying one Costco-sized toilet paper bundle instead of six so that those uh, around you can also buy some, right? How is it that you can participate? Well, I think the first step is defining the others in your life. Who are your neighbors? 
Who do you live close to? If you can't answer that, now might be a really good time to start. But do you have seniors who you can run errands for so they can stay safe? Do you have neighbors who will be out of work and may need help paying a bill? Do you have neighbors whose kids will be out of school with no one to watch them? What needs might your others have? And what can you do about it? How can we be Timothys in these upcoming weeks? How can we be people who show genuine concern, not just for ourselves? This is a chance, church, to put our money where our mouths are. Our leader, our Lord, Jesus Christ, in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, told us that the most important things on this earth, our highest priorities, ought not to be our own comfort or our own safety. No, our highest priorities, if we truly follow Jesus, are to love him with everything we have and are, and to love others as ourselves, to show a genuine concern for others.